Good morning, everyone. Our group, Group 3, the Oton Group, will present to you the topic, Classical Management Theory. Theory. This video presentation is presented to Mr. Fortunato Gidalanga, our professor in theories and principles in educational management subject. Likewise, this is the fruit of the collaboration of the following presenters. We have Mrs. Joyce Tondo, Mr. Joseph Tondo, Mrs. Jonalyn Waisalova, Mrs. Mary Ana Silar, Mrs. Claire Gibarido, and Mrs. Lucelle Joy Paniergo. Here are the objectives of our report in connection with classical management theory. One, define classical management theory. Two, identify the theories under classical management theory in their characteristics. Three, name the founders of the classical management theory and their contributions. Four, give the advantages and disadvantages as well as the characteristics of its theory. And five, relevance of its theory to the present work. For topic number one, Scientific Management Theory by Frederick W. Taylor. This topic will be discussed to you by yours truly, Joseph E. Tondo and Mrs. Joyce P. Tondo. For your information, classical management theory was possibly created due to the conglomeration of the three founding management theories, namely, one, scientific management theory, two, administrative management theory, and three, bureaucratic management theory. These theories serve as the great grandparents of the organizational studies. So what are management theories and their importance? Management theories help organizations to focus, communicate, and evolve. Using management theory in, in the workplace allows leadership to focus on their main goals. When a management style or theory is implemented, it automatically streamlines the top priorities for the organization. Then who founded the classical management theory? Here are the founders of classical management theory. We have Frederick W. Taylor for scientific management theory, Max Weber for bureaucratic management theory, and Henry Fiol for administrative management theory. Classical management came about during the Industrial Revolution that is late 1700s to the late 1800s. During this time, power, machinery inventions, and transportation were ingredients to spark the Industrial Revolution. Here are some of the emerging issues at the time of the Industrial Revolution. One, large groups of people working together. Two, people working alongside machineries. Three, increasing pace of industry. And four, companies were looking for answers to solve problems. And who is Frederick W. Taylor? Frederick W. Taylor was born into a wealthy family in the United States in 1856. He graduated from Stevens Institute of Technology as a mechanical engineer in 1883. He also sought to improve industrial efficiency. Frederick W. Taylor also wanted to make organizations more standardized, efficient, and productive by studying their work process closely and he is known as the father of scientific management. And what is Frederick W. Taylor's theory? 
Frederick Taylor's scientific management theory is also called as classical management theory. It emphasizes on efficiency, much like Max Weber's. However, according to Taylor, rather than scolding employees for very minor mistake, employers should reward workers for increased productivity. Now, scientific management answers the following questions. One, how are we going to organize all of this? Two, how are, how are we going to maximize productivity? And three, how are we going to manage all these people? Why Frederick Taylor is called the father of scientific management? Frederick W. Taylor is known as the father of scientific management, which also came to be known as Taylorism. Taylor believed that it was the role and the responsibility of the manufacturing plant managers to determine the best way for the worker to do a job and to provide the proper tools and training. And what are the goals of scientific management? The main goal of scientific management is to develop all men to their greatest efficiency and prosperity. The specific objectives are to enhance production and productivity, decrease the cost of production, and maximize prosperity, both for the employer and the employees having the common interests and not the other way around. Good morning, I am Mrs. Joyce P. Tondo for the continuation of our report in Taylor's Scientific Management Theory. Here are the four main principles in Taylor's Scientific Management Theory. First, the first main principle is the division of labor. It wanted to determine the work process into small, simple, and separate steps is equal to division of labor. Each step or two was performed by a different person. Wanted to determine the one best way, a standard, to do every part of every task to boost productivity. Second, we have hierarchy. Wanted a clear chain of command that separated the managers from workers. Managers would design work process and enforce how the work was performed, and employees simply follow directions. We also have the selection, training, and compensation. Wanted to select and train high-performing workers or first-class employees and match them to a job that best suited them. Believe the most productive worker should be paid more, and employees who could not meet the new higher standard were fired. Method Time and motion studies. Time is equal to what is the least amount of time on average it took to perform each task and even each part of each task. Motion what were the fewest number of motions required for each small task? Wanted employees to work as if they were machines. Example of time and motion studies. First is the shovel experiment. Using larger shovels in a work to make work done faster and in less time. Second, we have the burger experiment. Instead of using one nozzle tube for dressing the toppings, three nozzle tubes were used in putting dressings to burgers with less time spent. In the third one, we have the Ford experiment. In making cars, different tasks are performed by different persons to make work easier, faster, and lighter, and done in less time. Here are the outcomes of Taylorism. It boosts productivity by 200% to 400%. More work accomplished with fewer people, 
meant more profit for companies, more consistent products of arguably higher quality. Companies often fail to pay employees more. Managers think employees do. Philosophy became normal. It also separated workers for the greater meaning of work. The skilled employees made them expendable. Survival of the fittest philosophy in harsh atmosphere. Employees burn out, dehumanization, and mental anguish. Here are the advantages of scientific management theory. We have enhanced production, ability to control, decreases in accuracy, decreased autocracy, cost of production reduced, the pay system, quick decision making, a benefit to customers, efficiency increased, best use of resources and development, beneficial to the nation, less production time, worker instructions, good working conditions, owners and investors benefited, and it avoids labor and management disputes. Here are the disadvantages of scientific management theory. First, it requires huge capital. Management takes control. Planning reduces productivity. It has the demotivating approach. It is overly bureaucratic. It is also mechanistic. It is not suitable for teams. Work division. It also avoids bargaining, loss, unemployment. It has also adverse effects. It creates stress. Wrong assumption. It follows narrow application and it is time consuming. Is classical management relevant today? While other management theories have evolved since then, classical management approaches are still used today by many small business owners to build their companies and to succeed. Are classical organization theory and scientific management still relevant today? The ideas of classical theorists have many applications in the management of today's organizations, although with some modifications. For example, Taylor's concern for the productivity of employees is still shared by managers. Even today, the scientific management theory is still relevant. Together with me is Mrs. Janeline Y. Salava. Henry Field's Theory of General Management from 1841 to 1925. Who is Henry Field? A French mining engineer and a management theorist. Studied at mining school in St. Etienne. Started as an engineer at a mining company and became director in 1888. Wrote a book in 1916 entitled Administration Industrial et General. First management thinker who provided the conceptual framework of the functions of management in his book. Due to his contribution to management theory and principles, Henry Fellow is rightly treated as the father of modern management thought. 14 Principles of Henry Fayol Division of Work Authority and Responsibility Discipline Unity of Command Unity of Direction Interest Remuneration Centralization Scalar Chain Order Equity Stability of Tenure Initiative and 
spread the carb. To learn, to learn more about his 14 principles of management, here are the discussions. Number one, division of work. When employees are specialized, output can increase because they become increasingly skilled and efficient. Number two, authority. Managers must have the authority to give orders, but they must also keep in mind that with authority comes responsibility. Number three, discipline. Discipline must be upheld in organizations, but methods of doing so can vary. Number four, unity of command. Employees should have only one direct supervisor. Number five, unity of direction. Teams with the same objective should be working under the direction of one manager using one plan. This will ensure that the action is properly coordinated. Number six, subordination of individual interest to the general interest. The interest of one employee should not be allowed to become more important than those of the group. This includes managers. Number seven, remuneration. Employee satisfaction depends on fair. Remuneration for everyone. This includes financial and non-financial compensation. Number eight, centralization. This principle refers to how close employees are to the decision-making process. It is important to aim for an appropriate balance. Number nine, scalar chain. Employees should be aware of where they stand in the organization's hierarchy or chains of command. Number 10, order. The workplace facilities must be clean, tidy, and safe for employees. Everything should have its place. 11, equity. Managers should be fair to staff at all times, both maintaining discipline as necessary and acting with kindness where appropriate. 12. Stability of tenure of personnel. Managers should strive to minimize employee turnover. Personal planning should be a priority. 13. Initiative. Employees should be given the necessary level of freedom to create and carry out plans. And lastly, number 14, spread the curves. Organizations should be strive to promote team spirit and unity. That's all for my report. Thank you. Good day to all. I am Junalyn Y. Saloba. And my task is to discuss the second part of Fayol's Administrative Management Theory. I will start with the five functions of Management Theory. Henry Fayol's Management Theory is a simple model of how management interacts with personnel. It covers concepts in a broad way so almost any business can apply his theory of management. Today, the business community considers Fayol's classical management theory as a relevant guide to productively manage staff. The management theory of Henry Fayol's includes 14 principles of management. From these principles, Fayol concluded that management should interact with personnel in five basic ways in order to control and plan production. As you can see in our chart there, number one of this function is planning. According to him, management must plan and schedule every part of industrial process. Then number two is organizing. He argued that in addition to planning, a manufacturing process management 
must also make certain of all the necessary resources, the raw materials, personnel, and etc. came together at an appropriate time of production. Number three is commanding. He stated that management must encourage and direct personnel activity. Number four, coordinating. According to FAIL, management must make certain that the personnel works together in a cooperative, cooperative fashion. And number five, controlling the final management activity. According to him, is for the manager to evaluate and ensure that personnel follow management commands. Henry Fayol's 14 principles of management have been a significant influence on in modern management theory. His practical list of principles helped early 20th century managers learn how to organize and interact with their employees in a productive way. Although the principles aren't widely used today, they can still offer guidance for today's managers. Many of the principles are now considered to be common sense, but at the time they were revolutionary concepts for organizational management. The advantage of Henry Fayol's theory is extremely comprehensive as a way to deal with management techniques. It is also the most used because it has been proven to work. Its advantage is being comprehensive as it covers just about anything one might need to do in a management position to ensure success. The disadvantage to the theory is that it is still based on humans. As humans, we are naturally going to make mistakes. The theory works on basis of having harmony among people in which unity forms to create a strong management team. However, when mistakes are made, it can undermine the entire strength of the team. Furthermore, if a person is found to be false and will not admit it, more problems can ensue. This is the same disadvantage of any system that relies on humans to be in control given various factors like personality and that mistakes can be made. Good day everyone, this is Claire Barido and with me is Mom Lucille Joy Paniergo to talk to you about the bureaucratic management theory. Now, let us know the person behind the bureaucratic management theory. So who is Max Weber? Max Weber is a German sociologist and author of the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Max Weber was born in 1864 and died in 1920. He described a theory to operate an organization in an effective way which is known as the bureaucratic management approach or Weberian bureaucracy. Now let us know what is bureaucracy. When we say bureaucracy, is an organizational structure that is characterized by many rules, standardized processes, procedures and requirements, number of desks, meticulous division of labor and responsibility, clear hierarchies and professional, almost impersonal interactions between employees. So in other terms, when we say bureaucracy, it is controlling or managing company or organization that is operated by a large number of officials employed to follow rules carefully. So these days, bureaucracy is often associated with negative connotation. But at the time, bureaucratic theory was developed by Weber. It was designed to solve problems with the way organizations are being run. 
Project Management Theory. Number one, a clear organizational hierarchy. Weber wanted each hierarchy to have legal authority. So in simple term, authority sits with a position and not a person. Number two, clear rules about decision making. Weber referred to this as a rational legal decision making rules. So in simple terms, organization should be governed by rules. According to Max Weber, the bureaucratic management approach emphasized the necessity of organizations to operate in a rational way instead of following the arbitrary whims or irrational emotions and intentions of owners and managers. He believed bureaucracy was the most efficient way to set up an organization, administration, and organizations. Max Weber believed that bureaucracy was a better than traditional structures. In a bureaucratic organization, everyone is treated equal and the division of labor is clearly described for each employee. So with these observations, he lays down the six basic principles of bureaucratic management. Principles of bureaucratic management. One, task specialization or division of labor. Tasks are divided into simple, routine categories on the basis of competencies and functional specializations. So each employee is responsible for what he or she does best and knows exactly what is expected of him or her. Each department has specific powers. Task specialization should be fixed and there should be a balance between power and responsibilities. Number two, hierarchical layers of authority. Managers are organized into hierarchical layers where each layer of management is responsible for its staff and overall performance. The hierarchy, hierarchy of authority is a system in which different positions are related in order of precedence and in which the highest rank on the ladder has the greatest power. The bottom layers are always subject to supervision and control of higher layers. Okay, next. Number three, formal selection. All employees are selected on the basis of technical skills and competencies, which have been acquired through training, education, and experience. The selection and promotion of workers should be based on equalization, like skills, experience, and age. One of the basic principles is that employees are paid for their services and that level of their salary is dependent on their position. Number four, rules and requirements. Formal rules and requirements are required to ensure uniformity so that employees know exactly what is expected of them. The organization uses rules to exert control. All administrative processes are defined in the official rules. By enforcing strict rules, the organization can move easily, achieve uniformity, and all employees' efforts can be better coordinated. Okay, next, number five, impersonal. Regulations and clear requirements create distant and impersonal relationships between employees, with the additional advantage of preventing nepotism or involvement from outsiders or politics. Interpersonal relationships are solely characterized by a system of public law and rules and requirements. Official views are free from any personal involvement, emotions, and feelings. So decisions are solely made on the basis of rational factors rather than personal factors. And the last one, number six, is career orientation. Employees of a bureaucratic organization are selected on the basis of their 
expertise. This helps in the deployment of the right people in the right positions and thereby optimally utilizing human capital. It is possible to build a career on the basis of experience and expertise. Thus, it offers a lifetime employment. So that would be all for my report and thank you for listening. Hi, good day everyone. My name is Lucille Joy Paniergo. I will discuss more about bureaucratic management theory by Max Weber. Here are some features of bureaucratic organization. One, high degree of division of labor and specialization. Two, there is a well-defined chain of command. Three, it follows the principle of rationality, objectively, and consistency. The relationship among the member of the organization is formal and impersonal relations, and it is based on positions and not on personalities. Fifth, rules and regulations are well defined and it indicates the duties and rights of the employees. These rules apply to everyone from top to bottom of the organization and must be strictly followed. Sixth, selection and promotion are based on technical qualifications. Seven, only bureaucratic or legal power is given importance. Now, what are the advantages of bureaucratic management theory? The great benefit of bureaucracy is that large organizations with many hierarchical layers can become structured and work effectively. It is precisely the established rules and procedures that allows for high efficiency and consistent execution of work by all employees. All this makes it easier for management to maintain, control, and make adjustments when necessary. Bureaucracy is specialized in evitable in organizations where legislation plays an important role in delivering a consistent output. So what is the disadvantage of bureaucratic management? Bureaucracy is characterized by a large amount of red tape, paperwork, main desk, certain office culture, and slow bureaucratic communication due to its many hierarchical layers. This is the system's biggest advantage of bureaucratic organization. It is also unfortunate that employees remain fairly distant from each other and the organization, making them less loyal. Bureaucracy is also extremely dependent on regulatory and policy compliance. This restricts employees to come up with innovative ideas making them feel like just a number instead of an individual. Later research, the human relation theory demonstrated that employers appreciate attention and want to have a voice in decision making. Here are some criticisms of bureaucratic management. One, the emphasis only on rules and regulation. Two, there will be unnecessary delays in decision-making due to formalities and rules of bureaucratic organization. Three, coordination and communication hampered because of too much formality and rules. Next, bureaucracy involves a lot of paperwork and has too much level of authority which results in a lot of waste of time, effort, and money, not ideal for efficiency. What else? Because of too much formality, a bureaucratic approach is not suitable for business. The bureaucratic model may be suitable for government organizations, like our school. Next, 
Too much importance is given to the technical qualifications of the employees for promotion and transfer. Dedication and commitment of the employee are not considered. And lastly, limited scope for human resource. The conclusion, the management principles suggested by them are universally accepted by modern authorities on management and are treated as valid even this day. This is because these principles are practical in nature and also result-oriented. These basic principles are useful for effective management of business activities. Thank you, good day, and mabuhay everyone.